Hello everyone. In this episode I would like to spend some time talking about a JavaScript uh, technology called Ajax. Ajax is kind of all the rage on the web nowadays. A lot of times it's seen as being fairly synonymous uh, with the term Web 2.0, which you hear people talk about pretty frequently. And what Ajax actually is, is really just uh, uh, one particular little particular little trick that uh, JavaScript has up, up its sleeve. One particular thing that uh, JavaScript can be used to accomplish. If you think about the way the web usually works, everything that occurs on a web page tends to be, uh, to a certain extent, what we would call synchronous. Meaning that when we load a page, uh, all of the data that's available in the JavaScript and in the HTML at that time is basically all of the data that the JavaScript and the HTML have available. In order for there to be any additional data or different data available to the JavaScript or the HTML, the page has to be reloaded again. But with Ajax, what we actually get is the ability to do asynchronous JavaScript calls. This basically means that JavaScript is able to make requests to the server for additional data for any kind of information it might happen to need, and it's able to do these requests without the page actually being reloaded. Ajax itself, A-J-A-X, actually stands for asynchronous... Oops. JavaScript and XML. So the asynchronous part uh, is basically what I just described to you and the JavaScript part of course means that JavaScript's what's doing things asynchronously. So JavaScript is able to asynchronously, uh, meaning not at the time that the page is reloaded, be able to request and gather additional data from the server which otherwise would not be available to it. Uh, the word and, of course, is just the word and. It's really nothing all that terribly significant. And the last word, XML, is actually a data format. It's uh, related in a lot of ways to HTML. XHTML is actually a combination of XML and HTML. And basically the reason that the XML is in there is that when this data is transferred from the server back to the JavaScript or possibly from the JavaScript to the server, that data has to be sent in some format that will be recognizable to both. It has to be something that JavaScript will be able to read and it'll have to be something that the server is able to understand and produce. So originally when this technique first was developed, XML was the language of choice, the data format of choice. It's fairly universal data format. It was something that JavaScript would work with relatively easy and certainly something that could be produced by a server without any trouble. But one of the funny things about Ajax nowadays is that XML, while it still can be used, we'll find is often not the most convenient data format to use. Instead, what we'll use a lot of times nowadays is a thing called JSON, which we've actually talked about before. Some people pronounce it JSON. I call it JSON. Don't ask me why. Uh, but JSON is JavaScript uh, object notation, JavaScript object notation. And what we can do is we can actually use JSON in place of the XML so it becomes asynchronous JavaScript and JSON or AJJ or something like that. Ajaj, I guess it would be called. Uh, anyway, Ajax uh, with XML in there certainly sounds like a much nicer acronym, something that's much more pronounceable. But nevertheless, it is something that's important to keep in mind that XML is not a requirement uh, necessarily to be able to do what they still nowadays call AJAX. Even if uh, XML isn't being used, uh, uh, AJAX is still the term that's typically used to kind of describe this, uh, this technique. So anyway, a uh, few quick examples. Uh, certainly one of the companies that's biggest into Ajax, or has been since the beginning, has been Google. I would imagine that probably most of you have seen Google Maps before. And if you actually think about how Google Maps works, you'll kind of start to see where Ajax lies in here. When we pull up Google Maps, it of course has an actual map down here for us at the bottom, which we can of course click and drag around. All fancy JavaScript tricks, no flash involved here. But the neat thing about it is that it would be unrealistic for this page to actually have detailed maps in three or four different forms of the entire world present in the HTML and the JavaScript at the time the page loads. If Google tried to put all of their detailed maps, all of their detailed images that they use here in their maps application into the HTML and the JavaScript, it would probably take this page half an hour or more to actually download. So what they do is when you first come to this page, you're shown sort of a starting map, but then whenever you move around, you'll sometimes notice the map kind of filling in and changing a little bit as you work your way around it. 
you see the effect even more when you zoom in. Sometimes you can kind of catch different blocks of the page reloading. And what's actually happening is every time we move the map or every time we zoom in to a different level of the map, the JavaScript is behind the scenes calling back to Google servers and requesting that new information be downloaded. It's using Ajax to do that so that all of this can actually happen without the page actually having to be uh, refreshed every time. It all happens asynchronously, sort of in the background you might say, without us ever actually having to hit the refresh button. So it's a pretty neat thing and can be used for a pretty spectacular effect. What I want to do in this particular example to kind of demonstrate this and to put our own little Ajax tool together is I have a uh, server running here on my local machine. You'll notice my address up here, localhost port 3000. I'm pulling up a page called newuser.html and what I have here on this particular page is I have a uh, user registration form. The user registration form asks for very generic sort of information like these things usually do. A user's first name, their last name, their email address, their username, and their password. Now basically where I plan on putting Ajax in here is that some of these pieces of data on this page are things that JavaScript can easily validate itself. Things like first name, it can confirm whether a first name is present or whether the field's blank. Same thing for last name. For email address, we can pretty use, easily use a regular expression to determine whether a valid email address has been used. <clears throat> for password, what we're going to want to do is simply make sure that the password meets our requirements. In this case, I've said that the password has to be at least eight characters long. But for something like username, there's a few different aspects of validating this username that we're going to have to uh, handle. One of them, of course, is that the username cannot be blank. It's a required field. But the other is that anybody registering for this site needs to pick a unique username, a username that no other user has used when they were registering. Now, one way to handle this would be to, in this page itself, either in the JavaScript or the XML somewhere, or I'm sorry, the XHTML somewhere, we could actually have the server automatically put in every registered user's username so that our JavaScript would then have access to it from its own little data store when it downloaded to a client's computer. But if we had a lot of users or if we were at all squeamish about letting our list of usernames get out, which frankly wouldn't be a too terribly good idea, then that wouldn't be a very practical way to be able to validate this username. So what we could do instead is we could instead have JavaScript automatically make an asynchronous call, an Ajax call, back to the server with whatever username the user fills in. Then the server can look up that username, see if it is taken or not, and, and then respond back to the JavaScript letting it know that yes that username is available or no that username is already taken. So that's more or less the field we're going to be concentrating on as far as our Ajax is concerned. It's having it talk to the server and find out what usernames are available and what usernames are not. The way that I've actually set up the validation for this form is a little bit different than we've talked about previously. Uh, previously when we've talked about uh, form validation we've basically done it in more or less sort of a synchronous manner where we more or less let the user fill out the form and then when they hit submit at that point we determine whether the form appears to be valid or not. What I've actually done in this example is just a little bit different. I've actually tied into what they call the on blur event for each one of these fields. So as soon as I leave the field, it immediately validates it. So here you can see I focused on the first name field. As soon as I left, it validated it, saw that it was blank, and it came back and told me that you cannot leave this field blank. If I come back here to the first name field and I type in some actual data and leave it, it, I have it set up to give me a little green check mark letting me know that that field is now complete to the best of JavaScript's ability to be able to check. So it goes through and it checks all these different things. You can see for the last name it says it can't be blank. For the email address it says the email address isn't valid. Right now for the username field I just have it pop up an alert box saying check the name because that's something that we're going to work on here in this episode and down here in the password field it comes back and says that the password must be at least eight characters long. If I go through and actually fill in these different fields uh, except for the username field since it's obviously not going to work right now you can see how it goes through and it gives me a green check mark every time a field is correct but if I go back to a field and I erase it it goes back to giving me the error message again. So I already have all of the validation for all of the fields except for username set up, so that's really the only thing that we need to concentrate on. But before we actually dig into that, let's go ahead and take a look at how I've done the validation that's available so far. 
what I essentially have here in my HTML file down at the bottom is inside my form, which begins up here on line 105, and goes all the way down here to the bottom of the body, is I have uh, all of my different form fields put in. Each one of the form fields, each one of the input fields specifically is set up in a format so that it will be understandable to the server that this is working with so I can actually submit this data and have it actually generate uh, new user registration records in a database. Um, uh, what I have is each one of the labels and the fields inside its own paragraph and all of that is basically already set up. One thing I don't have you'll notice is inside each one of those paragraphs I do not have an image so that green check mark or the yellow warning sign are being dynamically added by the JavaScript. Uh, the way I actually did that then was up in the head section of this document which is fairly long because of all the JavaScript that's in there already. Uh, I have basically in a window.onload event I assign a function to it so as soon as this page is loaded what I do is I go and I get all of the paragraph tags that are inside the new user element which is the form itself and uh, I assign that array of paragraph tags here to a uh, p variable, a variable called p. The next thing I do then is I have a for loop that's going to go through all those paragraphs okay? for what it'll do what it'll do for each one of them is it will create an image uh, uh, element, an image HTML element Okay. It will then go and actually retrieve the input tag that's inside that particular paragraph and it will then set the images ID so that its ID is the same as the input fields ID except it will have underscore image assigned to the end of it. Here then I actually go and I append the image to the paragraph so I end up with the image tag there at the end of every paragraph so it's ready to go to actually accept uh, whatever image I choose to assign to it. Initially I don't put an image into it at all I wait until the, we're actually doing our validation before I put any images in. Right. The next thing I do then is as we go through this for loop and we check each one of our paragraphs I use a regular expression here to actually look at the ID for that paragraph or I'm sorry for that input field so in this case what I'm saying is that if the input field has the string name NAME somewhere as part of its night as its ID then I'm going to assign to its on blur event a function that I've written called check name which is down below here I'll show it to you here in a second if the ID of the input tag has email in it then I assign my check email function if the ID of the input field has username in it then I assign my check username function and if it's a password I assign my check password function so more or less I have it sort of generically going through and based on the actual IDs of the input fields guessing at what type of field that is and then assigning the appropriate type of validation to its on blur event now my actual functions that will go through and do the validation are fairly simple for the most part at the moment. The check name for example, which more or less is just making sure that a field isn't blank, okay, takes the actual field itself. Okay. Since the check name function in this case is part of the on blur event for the input field, inside that function whenever we refer to this we're referring to the field itself. So here I'm saying if the value of this field's length is greater than zero, then that means everything is okay. When everything is okay, I have another function that I've written called show valid, which I pass this element to. So basically I'm passing the input tag to it. Whenever we have a field that isn't valid, uh, for example up here if the length of the value of the name fields are not greater than zero, then I call show invalid, I pass it the input field along with the message that I wanted to display. You cannot leave this field blank. I do more or less the same thing for all of the validation that I already have in here. For check email, I do the exact same thing except other than just looking for blank, I have this big long gnarly looking regular expression which looks for a valid, validly formatted email address. If the email address is valid then it shows it as being valid, otherwise it shows it as being invalid and says the email address does not appear to be valid. Like I mentioned before, for check username, right now all I have in there is an alert. This is where we're going to be doing most all of our work. For check password, I have it check for any character repeating eight times. As long as it has that, it's valid. Otherwise, they get this error message that goes along with that field. Right? What I then have is the actual show valid and show invalid functions, along with one additional one that I figured we would need when we did our AJAX called show waiting. Whenever I mark a field as being valid, what I do is I simply take the input tag, I go to its parent node, which is the paragraph, 
and from that paragraph I ask it to give me all of the image tags inside that paragraph. Now get elements by tag name of course returns an array but I know that there's only one image in each one of them so as soon as that array is returned I immediately just take the zeroth element and I end up with the image tag stored there. Now that I think about it, I probably could have simplified that a little bit since I gave the image an ID. I could have just done get element by ID based on the ID of the input field, but oh, what the, what the, hey, this is probably going to work out just fine. Anyway, once the actual image is, uh, is uh, retrieved, what I do next is I assign to the source of that image my accepted image, which is that green che uh, check mark. If uh, you actually take a look at my images folder, I have the green check mark, which is called accepted.png. I have the yellow warning sign, which is called warning.png. And then I also have this little animated GIF called loading, where the arrows will spin around. So anyway, um, anytime it's valid, that's what we do. We go through and we just load up the green check mark. The last thing I do is I have another function called clear warnings, which might just clear out any warning that had happened to be there previously in case they uh, start filling out the field and it's invalid and then they come back to it again. It'll correctly replace the uh, warning message with a valid message instead. The show invalid function is just a little bit more complicated. It starts off the same way though, retrieving the image tag from the paragraph with the invalid input field in it and then putting the warning image into it. I then clear out any previous warnings that might happen to be there. Then what I do is I create a new span, a new set of span tags essentially. Right? I take the actual message, the error message that's supposed to be displayed, I turn that into a text node and I append that to my span called warning. I give that particular uh, span a class of warning, which I then use with CSS to style it. I give it an ID, which is the same as the input field's ID with underscore warning at the end of it. And here I actually then take that warning span and I append it to the um, paragraph, the paragraph which is the parent node of the input tag. The very last function here I have that I've already written in is the clear warning um, function. This one's just meant to go through and clear out any warning that might have already previously been there in a uh, paragraph, in one of the paragraphs with the input fields. It goes in and it checks to see if there is a warning uh, in that particular paragraph and if there is what it does is it retrieves that warning and then it goes to the parent of the warning Okay, which is the paragraph and tells the paragraph to remove the child which is the warning so it actually gets rid of it there and as you saw a minute ago everything looks like it pretty much works just fine if I reload here and start off fresh okay, if I leave the first name field I get the warning if I go back to the first name field and put something in it's not blank anymore so the warning goes away and I get the green check mark instead so everything is functioning just fine the way it is right now and what we then need to concentrate on next is going back and actually putting something back here into the check username function which will then utilize some Ajax code that we'll write. So then moving forward uh, basically what I'm going to want to do here with the check username function is I'm actually going to want to have a couple of layers of checks here. The first check is that I'm simply going to want to make sure that there actually is a username given in the username field because if there's not then obviously it won't be valid and I don't see any point in actually sending a request to the server in that particular case. So I'm going to start off by saying if um, uh, this dot value dot length is greater than zero, right? meaning if there is actually something filled in this field, then this is where we're going to want to do our Ajax call. Right? Otherwise, okay, what I'm actually going to want to do here at this point is simply show that this thing is invalid. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy one of my show invalid function calls and say uh, you uh, cannot leave this field blank. There we go. Lost those letters for some reason. So let me just leave it at that for the moment and see how that reacts. Uh, if I come back over and reload my form again, I come down there to my username field and then leave it again, I get my warning message that you cannot leave this field blank. If I actually fill something into it and leave it, okay, right now nothing's actually happening. It's just leaving the message that was already there previously. But of course the next step here would be that I want to actually go ahead and do the Ajax call. And then based on what value I get back from the Ajax call, I'll then determine whether I want to uh, mark it as valid or not, one way or the other. So what I'm going to do here is before I actually do the Ajax call, I'm going to call my show warning function, 
Okay. My uh, not show warning. I'm sorry. Show waiting. Okay. My show waiting function then I'll have put in a little spinning icon to let the user know that there actually is something occurring there. If I come back and take a look at that again in my browser, okay, if I type something in and leave, that's what my little waiting symbol is going to look like that lets them know that something is being processed in the background, or at least that's hopefully what they'll understand that that means. Right. Now for the Ajax call itself, okay, what I want to do is I actually want to put together all my Ajax uh, functionality and put it over in a separate file so that this will be something that we could potentially reuse again in the future. Let's say I'm going to call this uh, Ajax request. That's what I'll actually call this function that's going to be doing this. Now the Ajax request itself is going to need some information to go along with it. First and foremost, it is going to require a URL. The URL is basically where this request from JavaScript will be sent, and it's that URL on the server uh, that will then be needed to uh, actually check and see if that username is available or not, and then return the value back. So let me show you here what I actually have running over on the server. Here on the server side of my application, what I've actually done is set up a server side script. This was actually written in Ruby on Rails. And basically what it does is it lets me form a URL that looks something like what I have up here in my address bar. HTTP colon local host because it's running on my local machine. Port 3000. I then go to the users. And then right here is where I actually put in the username. I then follow that with slash check dot and the format that I want the request to be returned in. So if I actually hit enter right here, Okay. It takes it just a second to load. The reason it takes it that second to load is I've actually introduced a uh, uh, sort of a false, sort of a make-believe one-second delay. The reason I've done that is so that it will simulate a little bit more closely the user's experience. With the client and the server both running here on my local machine, if I didn't put in that fake delay, it would return almost instantaneously, which is certainly not what will usually happen with the user. Usually there'll be at least a little bit of latency that will slow it down a bit, so I've put in sort of an automatic one second latency all the time. But here when I've put in this particular URL, basically submitting Noah as my uh, submitted username, what I see show up down here in my browser window is just the word false. But if I actually go and look at the code for that page, what it's given back to me is a valid XML file, a valid XML data. This first line is just saying what version and type of encoding the XML is in. I then have a set of hashtags, which are pretty much just sort of a uh, leftover from the particular quick and easy technique I use to make this data. And then the most important Importantly, what I have in here is I have an XML tag called taken. I just made that up. Its type is Boolean and that's insignificant to us, but the actual value of the taken tag is false. So what that's actually telling me is, is the user Noah name, is the username Noah taken? And the answer is false. It's not. It's available. If I were to come up here and put in a username that is already taken, Victrola, there's my one second delay and it comes back with true. So this is the XML that was returned in this case. So more or less the question we asked is, is the username Victrola taken? And it came back and told us taken is true. So that's what we're actually going to be dealing with here initially on the server. And just for your reference, I've created two users uh, on my server already that have the username Victrola and Bernard. So we have a little bit of test data to work against. Now, as far as the actual URL for the um, JavaScript goes, for our AJAX request goes, what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to pass in this URL as a string, except instead of actually having Victrola hard-coded in there, I am going to append in the value of this particular field. So whatever the username or whatever the user has filled into the form field for username, that value is what will actually get put there into the URL. That's what will then cause eventually the request to be sent to the server and the server will return data to us, uh, letting us know whether it's taken or not. Besides the URL, the AJAX request also is going to have a number of different options that go with it. Um, the actual AJAX call uh, down in the guts of JavaScript that we'll deal with here in a few minutes, we're going to find lets us do things like specify what type of request we want to have sent. Basically, is it going to be a get request or a put request or a post request or a delete request? Uh, a lot of times we're just going to want to be very simply using a get request just for the simplicity of it. But it would be nice in the future if we were able to modify that, change that if we decided we needed to use this same code for some other purpose.
Another one of the options that the AJAX request might need is uh, do, dealing with the uh, asynchronous behavior of the request itself. The way that we're actually going to end up putting in the AJAX request is we have the option of making it synchronous or asynchronous. Now surely we're going to want it to be asynchronous the majority of the time, but again if we ever run into a situation in the future where we do want it to be a synchronous request, basically meaning it won't go until the page is reloaded, then I want to be able to specify that too. So the way I'm actually going to set up this AJAX request function, which we still haven't written, just talked about a lot, is the second argument I'm going to pass to it is just going to be an object. That object will be something that in the future I could possibly populate with uh, values, meaning uh, make it synchronous or use a different uh, type of request, a different method than get. But that's what I'll have for right now. The third thing I'm going to want to put in here is what would generally be called a callback. Basically a callback is actually going to be a function here. So I'm actually going to pass a function to my function is kind of the idea. So my first argument is the URL itself right here. All right. Uh, the second argument, of course, is an empty object at the moment. And the third argument is going to be a function that I'm passing. Basically, the role this function is going to play is that whenever this function is uh, passed to my AJAX request function, the AJAX request function will go through all the generic workings of forming the AJAX call, sending it off, waiting for a proper response. And then when that response is returned, it's going to need to know what to actually do with it. So the idea is going to be that once the request actually comes back, once the response, I guess I should say, actually comes back, we're going to have it actually pass it to this function. So I'm going to tell this function that it's going to receive the request object, which is going to have the response data stored within it. And then here inside this, this is where we'll actually then do our work. Here I'll say uh, process response for right now. Okay, But before we deal with that part of it, we need to actually go and get this AJAX request function put together. So I am going to create a new file called, I think I'll just call it AJAX, that's usually what I call it. And I'm going to uh, make that file available here to my HTML page by importing it. I'm going to do an import for uh, JavaScripts, that's the name of the folder it's going to be in, and the file is going to be called AJAX.js. Okay. Here's the actual AJAX.js file itself. Right now it's empty, but this is where I'm going to put in all of the actual AJAX workings, starting with my AJAX request function, which I've kind of uh, already called in a way from my other file. Let me just put a comment there. This thing's going to be a little bit long, so I'm going to comment that closing brace. Okay. Now from our other file, what we were actually passing to this function is we're passing it the URL, we're passing in an, obje an object, which I'm going to call options, and then the third thing we're passing is the function, which I'm going to call callback. Right? Now, actually into this function, uh, this function is going to deal quite a bit with a request, so I'm going to start off here by creating a request object and just setting it to null. I guess it's not really an object at this point, a request variable that I'm just going to set to null for the moment. Okay? And here in a minute we'll see how to actually make that request that will do the uh, AJAX part of all of this. The other thing I want to go ahead and do is resolve some of the different values that may or may not be present in that options object that I'm passing as the second parameter to this function. Uh, right now I'm thinking that there are probably two different values that I'm going to want in there. I'm going to want a method and I might want uh, to specify whether I want it to be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, maybe I'll call it sync. There we go. So what I'm going to do with these two is I'm basically going to say from the options object if there's something called method in there then take it otherwise take a value called get. For synchronous, I'm going to say in the options object, if there is something in there called sync, take that value, otherwise take true. So I'm essentially uh, giving myself the ability in the future to set either one of those two values, but I'm also setting uh, default values, the values that I expect to use most frequently here, so that if I don't put anything in, I'll always get sort of the regular default working the way I would normally want it. So that's most of the setup, and what comes next then is actually getting into the actual AJAX itself. Uh, this is a little bit like some of those cookie examples we did where all of the setup is far more complicated than the actual focus of the work itself. But we are actually finally there of doing the AJAX.
Now basically the way the Ajax works is that uh, depending on what browser you have you're going to have an object available and that object is what is going to essentially enable you to make these asynchronous Ajax calls. The only trick to doing this is that every browser in the world uses one particular object and then there's one browser, Internet Explorer, that uses something different from everybody else. So to do this correctly we actually have to figure out which of those two objects we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by putting in an if statement and I'm going to say if in the window object there is something there called xml.http request right, then that means that we're dealing with a non Internet Explorer browser right? and this is the object that it'll have so that'll be the object that we actually go through to do the rest of our Ajax work. If it's not Internet, or if it's not not Internet Explorer, I guess you could say, then I could check to see if I have something available in here called window.activex object, which is the way that Internet Explorer does AJAX. So uh, let me put in a comment here. Uh, this is for IE. This one is for non IE. Uh, essentially what's going to end up in both of these is going to be pretty much the same but there will be a couple of tiny little minor differences so let's start off up here the way we would do it for every browser that's not Internet Explorer what we need to do first is we need to actually generate our XML HTTP request object I'm going to create that object and I'm going to put it into my request variable and I'm going to do that simply by saying that I want a new XML HTTP request object right. basically just like that uh, once I actually have that request object there's going to be a few other things that I want to do with it okay? uh, the one of the first things I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to set it up so that uh, it can automatically call another part of my JavaScript code here whenever it uh, undergoes what's called a state change basically the what's going to happen here is that when we actually send this request uh, every internet request goes through a number of different steps there's a step where the request is ready but it hasn't actually been sent there's a step a state I guess I should say where the request has been sent there's a state where the request has been uh, received by the server but not yet replied to and then finally there's also a state where um, the server has replied and the reply has been and the reply has been received back here in our JavaScript and what we need to do is we need for our JavaScript to be sensitive to what state the request object is in so that when it goes into the proper state we then know that we've received our value back and we're ready to start dealing with whatever it happens to be so we can keep track of these different changes of state by using the on ready state change event which is built into the request object and what I'm going to do is into that particular uh, event I'm going to put in a new function and in that function I'm going to have it call another part of my JavaScript here which will actually be in charge of monitoring the request and then dealing with it once it's complete uh, let's call this um, uh, function that I'm going to call here state changed All right. and to the state changed function I am going to pass the actual request object because that's where the response will be stored and I'm going to pass it the callback because once the request is complete it's the callback that it's going to want to call and uh, give that request to All right. so anyway that takes care of that part probably clear as mud if I had to guess the next thing we need to do is we need to actually open the request object. We do that using its open method. The uh, open method needs to be given the uh, actual method of the request. So basically, is it get or put, uh, get or put or post? Uh, more or less what we set up here and okay? get by default. We need to give it the actual URL that the request is going to be sent to, which was one of the parameters that I passed to this particular function. And then I need to let it know whether it's going to be synchronous or not, which again is one of the values that I got up here from options or set to a default value. So by having true there, that's going to mean do it asynchronously. The next thing I need to do then, once the request is actually opened and populated with the correct data, is I need to actually send the request. So I'm going to say send the request. I'm going to pass it null. Uh, to be honest, I forget exactly what that null stands for, but <clears throat> with the non-Internet Explorer version, uh, I do believe that has to be there. So that'll more or less be it. That will uh, create our, our Ajax request object, tell it what to do as it goes through the different changes of its life. It'll open it and it'll send it.
What we need to do next then is we need to do essentially the exact same thing down here in case we're dealing with Internet Explorer. If it's Internet Explorer, what we're going to do is we're going to get our request object uh, by doing a new ActiveX object. Right. Uh, when we call the ActiveX object here, we need to pass it Microsoft, I misspelled that, S-O-F-T, Microsoft.XMLHTTP. And that's what will actually tell ActiveX, apparently, in this case, to create a AJAX object, an object, an AJAX request object, so that this can be accomplished. Okay. What I'm going to do next, then, <clears throat> is going to be essentially the same thing I did up here. So I'm just going to copy that code. The changes are going to be fairly minor. The on ready state change business is going to stay exactly the same. The opening of the request is going to stay exactly the same. When I send the request, though, no null there. Otherwise, pretty much everything else is identical. So that more or less takes care of the actual AJAX part of it. That will make sure that the actual request is sent, sent to the correct place in the correct manner, and everything will be fine, hopefully. <laughs> so what we have next then is we need to deal with this state changed method. So I'm going to come down here in my file, and I'm going to add that method now. There we go. Right. Here in the state change method is where we need to actually deal with the request when it is uh, going through its what I think of as being basically its changes of life uh, through the different states that it's going to occupy as the request progresses. So um, <clears throat> the request itself, like I said, has different states. Each one of those states, are, we're going to be able to find out what it is by looking at a attribute called uh, ready state that's uh, state, S-T-A-T-E, that's available from the request object. And what we want is we want ready state to be equal to 4. That basically means that the request is complete. So I'm going to put this into an if statement. So more or less the state change method will ignore all of the different changes that the request object goes through until eventually the ready state becomes 4, which at that point should mean that it is complete. The request is complete and data has been returned. Now, just because the data has been returned doesn't necessarily mean that the request went well. Uh, as all of you have probably done at one time or another, you know that you could type in a bad URL and get back a 404 error or something like that. So what we want is we actually only want to proceed from this point if the request object's status, which is another attribute available in the object, is equal to 200. 200 in this case would mean success. It me would mean that the request was sent, the response was received, there were no errors that anybody was aware of. All right. The last thing I'm going to do then is I'm going to say if we have a callback, meaning if the callback is not null, which it potentially could be, then what I want to do is I want to call that callback function. I want to pass it my request object. So that's pretty much all I'm really going to need there. It would be a good idea probably if I threw some else's to go along with these, maybe some little alerts in here to let users know about errors. More realistically, it would probably be a good idea if these things were actually additional callback type functions so that I could kind of customize the error behavior to the particular application. But for now, I'll just throw in some alerts. Here in this particular alert, I'll say, um, let's see, what do I want to say? I'll say problem receiving the data. Down here, maybe I'll put another else in. This one's for the ready state. Okay. For this one, uh, actually, I don't want anything for this one because I don't want it chirping away every time the ready state isn't 4 because that would be very expected. The ready state won't always be 4. So I, now that I think about it, I'll leave that one off. All right. So that more or less gets all of that put together. Uh, at this point, I think we are ready to kind of give it a first dry run test. Let me just get that out of my way. Right? and see how it actually behaves. Um, what should happen now is if we come back and we look at our check username function, the check username function will make sure that the uh, value in the username field is greater than zero. If it is, it'll show the waiting symbol. It'll then do our AJAX request, and if our AJAX request is successful, it will call this function right here, and it should pop up an alert that says proce uh, process response. So let's give it a shot and see if it works. I just reloaded it here in my browser. If I go to my username field and then leave it again, it tells me it can't be blank. If I go to the username field and fill something in, I get my waiting mark. 
and there we go process response has come back so it's called my callback function technically at this point in the process the data that the server returned is actually sitting there in that request object so all we really need to do now is actually deal with it so here inside the uh, my callback function instead of having that alert in there this is where I actually now want to go about dealing with my um, dealing with that actual response uh, doing whatever it is that I actually want to do with it what I essentially want to do with it is I want to take that XML data that the uh, server returned and I want to pull out the part of it that's actually important to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a taken variable and in that taken variable or to get that taken variable what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the request object. The request object has in it a uh, data member, a, uh, a uh, variable essentially called response XML which is where the XML data that was returned is actually stored. Because it's XML, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that I now want the document element. That basically gives me the root of the XML, uh, basically the hashtags that, I, uh, that we saw in there previously. And then from those hashtags, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it I want to get elements by tag name. Okay? And the actual element I want to get, the tag essentially I want to get, is the tag called taken. Okay. Now, sort of like we dealt with before, uh, get elements by tag name is actually going to return an array. Uh, I should know that there's only going to be one element in that array. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a, a subscript of zero right there to go ahead and give me that very first element. That line got a little bit long. There we go. I'll just uh, indent it a little bit less uh, so it all stays on one line. Hopefully it looks a little bit less confusing that way. Okay. Now, uh, at this point, I should have the actual taken tags stored here inside my taken variable. What I'm going to want to do at that point is I want to delve into that taken tag and actually get the true or false uh, word out of it. So I'm going to say if taken.firstchild, uh, which should be the uh, text node that's actually inside that element, then I'm going to put dot .data, which gives me back the actual text itself. I'm going to say if that data is equal to the string false, okay, then false is going to mean that their uh, false is going to mean that the username is not taken. Uh, Got to keep that straight in my mind. So if the name's not taken, that means everything's good. So I'm going to show valid. Uh, with show valid, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it uh, this. Uh, show valid needs to know what uh, which area of the form to actually put this into but the this right here I think is actually going to give me a little bit of trouble uh, this worked fine when I used it up here but it will not work okay uh, down here at least I don't imagine it will we could go ahead and give it a test just to make sure that I'm right about this type in something here and sure enough you see nothing ever happened if I go and take a look at my errors, there should be something related to this. Uh, result of expression input dot parent node is not an object, so it's talking about line 89. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that's in my show valid function. 89, sure enough, right here. So whatever I'm passing is this at that point uh, does not have a parent node, which is causing an error. Uh, what's actually occurring here is I have a little bit of trouble uh, with what's called a closure. Essentially, I have a variable here sort of in the outer part of this outer function called check name. But inside check name, there's an inner function, this anonymous function in here just called function. And in this particular case, this has a different value. Uh, it has to do with the way that JavaScript actually handles the value of this. So what I'm going to do up here is I'm going to create a new variable called target, and I'm going to assign this to it. What that'll then let me do is refer down here to target, and target will always be whatever this was at this particular point in the code. Closures can be a little bit confusing in JavaScript, something you might want to practice with a little bit. Maybe I'll uh, put together a future episode about closures uh, to maybe help clear that up a little bit. Okay? But one way or another, if false is there, then show valid to true is basically the idea. If uh, false is not there, then we're going to show invalid. All right. We're going to pass it target right, along with an error message. I'll say that username is taken. For some reason that capital U right there is bothering me. So let's see how that works. Back over to my form. I'm going to reload it. Go to the username field. Unfocus it. I left it blank. It caught that. If I type in a username that's taken, like Victrola, 
as soon as I leave, I get my one second pause, and then sure enough, it comes back and tells me my username is taken. If I put in a different username, Noah, when I unfocus, one second pause, and now it's telling me it's okay. So it looks like it's working just fine. Let me try putting in Bernard. This should be taken. Sure enough, it is. So it looks like our Ajax is behaving there just exactly the way that we would want it to. And hopefully the way that we've got our little Ajax uh, file put together, uh, it will be something that we can reuse in the future simply by passing different options to it, different URLs, and can take care of most of our Ajax needs. I mentioned to you back at the beginning that even though it's called AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, XML doesn't necessarily actually have to be the data format that's used for returning a response from the server. If we actually come back over and take a look at my server again, this is where I was actually retrieving my XML data with my URL. I've actually set the server up so that instead of putting .ajax or .xml at the end, if I instead put .json, what it does is it returns the exact same data to me in JSON format. In this particular case, my browser is not exactly sure what to do with it, so it actually downloaded it. But if I come and I take a look at the file that it downloaded, this is what was actually in it. It's essentially the exact same data we saw before with the XML, except now it's actually in JavaScript format, JavaScript object notation. So as hopefully you remember from before, the curly braces mean it's an object. This object has an attribute in it called taken, and that particular attribute has a value of true. So when we're dealing with this kind of situation, a server returning a value back to JavaScript, having the server return this data in a JavaScript format can sometimes simplify the actual handling of that data when it's returned. So a lot of this business that we had to go through with the XML to retrieve the actual bit of data that we wanted can essentially go away if we're doing this with uh, JSON instead. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to comment out the XML part of the uh, 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 handler. Okay? As a matter of fact, what I think I might do is let me just comment out this entire request. Uh, I'm going to copy it and then comment it out and let's just sort of rewrite it. I'll paste it back in. Instead of doing all this stuff in the request, let me take that out and up here in my URL, instead of asking it for XML data, I'm going to tell it that I want JSON data instead. What, everything up until that point should work the, fun, the same. We'll still end up here in our callback function, but now our callback function in the request object will be receiving uh, JSON data instead of the uh, actual XML data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable here. I'm going to call it response, and I'm then going to assign to that response variable uh, the, um, well, basically a set of uh, parentheses. Right? And inside that set of parentheses, what I'm going to append in here is going to be the requests uh, response text attribute. Now, you might remember up here before when we were dealing with the request in XML, the data was actually stored in a thing called response XML. Here, because the data isn't XML, it's something else, it's returned to us in a format called response text. I spell that right? Yeah, I think that's right. By actually taking that response text, putting a set of parentheses around it, and giving it to the eval function, what will happen is that response text will stop just being text, and it will instead turn into an actual JavaScript object here called response. Uh, so what I'm going to do next then is I can just go straight to working with it. There's really nothing else that's particularly required here. I can just say if not response.taken. So response, of course, is the object. The object has an attribute in it called taken, which is either going to be true or false. If it is uh, false, the not sign will make it become true, right? in which case we know that our response uh, or our username is not taken. So I can just say show valid. And I'll pass it uh, target, same way I did before, for the same reason. Okay? Otherwise, I will show invalid. And uh, here I need to pass it the target again and my error message. The username, or maybe I should make it that username is taken, something like that. So it's not a huge difference, or at least not in this particular case. Of course, this particular case is fairly simplistic since there's only one value that's being returned from the server. 
Uh, but given how much data is being returned that one value, it did save us a little bit of complication, I would say. And you can imagine that if we were returning five or 10 or 100 values from the server, having it actually here in sort of a native JavaScript format certainly does make the handling of that data much, much more simple. Let's go give it a try and make sure that it works. Reload my form, username blank, can't leave it blank. Put in a username that's not taken, one second pause, and everything's good. Put in a username that is taken, one second pause, and it recognizes that it's taken. Username that's not taken, it accepts that. Username that is taken, and there we go. So that works just fine. Working with JSON data is typically my preference. Uh, when I'm making AJAX calls from JavaScript, that might not always be an option. But when it is an option, especially when you're handling both the server and the client side of things, you can usually make it an option if you want it to. And uh, it certainly does make things quite a bit more uh, streamlined to be able to handle it that way.